What's happening, guys? Super fun video today. I got a special guest, Ian Westerman from Essential Tennis. What's up, guys? And we have Joel, your co-writer for this new book you're coming out. And Scotty's here, too. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to actually take a chapter from this book and examine it, right? So you want to tell us a little bit about the, the chapter? We're going to make Joel and Scott duke it out while they observe each other and analyze each other's strokes and while you and I do the same thing, right? Yeah. So we're going to do a kind of a collective like breakdown because so many players, when they warm up, they're so self-focused and they totally miss the opportunities that they have on the other side of the court. So chapter 24 of Essential Tennis is warm up like Sherlock Holmes. That's exactly what we're going to do today. Sounds like we're going to do some investigating. That's right. Get out your magnifying glass. That's right. All right, so let's jump into this and then we got to tell them more about this amazing book uh, afterwards, yeah? Sounds good. All right, let's jump into the action. All right, so most of you guys know Scotty. Scott played at University of Maryland, D1 player, uh, probably playing at a 5-0, I mean, pushing 5-5 five, five level at times, but solid. But look, everyone, they're just meeting Joel. Tell us. Well, yeah. Uh, you want me to hold this? Or? Yeah, I mean, it would be awkward if I just let it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say Joel's a 4-0 to solid 4-0 uh, player, maybe sometimes approaching 4-5. His forehand is pretty spinny. And he sometimes hit, hits it confidently, but mm -hmm. other times it kind of turns into a pushy kind of moon ball if he's not confident, like okay. if he's really feeling some pressure. His backhand side is much more drivey. He has an aggressive grip with his uh, left hand yeah. and sometimes has a hard time clearing the net. Uh, at the net, he tends to be pretty heavy handed. Yep. He can put balls away, but doesn't have a whole lot of like touch or finesse. And I would say his serves are the most like confident and like technically sound swings. Oh, like right. very unlikely to break down, hits a lot of spin, and like very like sound like mechanically. It'd be interesting to see how, how what their synopsis of one another. Thank you, sir. <laughs> of of uh, of one another. Scott likes pace. I mean, he definitely wants to yeah. get out here and bang the ball. I'm curious if if the the floating spin if that'll throw off for them. But let's see what these guys are thinking of one another what what and, and the idea here what are they picking up in the warm-up are they spotting each of other's other weaknesses person. of each other yeah right. yeah all right so let's take a look all right guys so what i'm doing in the warm-up and i think a lot of rec players aren't doing this is i'm paying sole attention to what i see on the other side of the court i'm going to send some probes and rip some balls deep i'm going to see how he's responding i'm going to drop some balls short i'm going to see how he's responding this is me having a chance to look at what the army I'm getting ready to fight has got in their arsenal before we start shooting cannons at each other. So I'm paying just close attention right now. Are we consistent off both wings? If I pick on this backhand four or five balls in a row, do I get an error? Yep, there's one. Let's just test the forehand out and see. Does anything funny happen if I pull them out wide? Oh look, he likes to go right back out wide. Really likes to go out wide. So I already have identified a pattern here, right? What if I drive deep to the backhand side? Let's see. Not super comfortable deep to the backhand side. So hitting with Scott here, there's definitely a psychological disadvantage knowing that he played college tennis and that, well, that's something I gotta kind of battle through. What I have noticed so far is none of his shots seem really weak but I don't think he wants to move so much like I think the more I can move him that might be my one chance. You know the more I can sort of get him going from one side of the court to the other. I've also hit a few slices of him, and about 75% of those slices have gone long. So one strategy might be to hit slices. Um, his backhands tend to fall short, so it could be when he hits his backhand that I look for an opportunity to come up and uh, put the ball away. Sorry, man. No worries. I'm gonna move him up a little bit, see what happens when he comes forward. Well, the fact that he took the ball in two bounces 
says to me he doesn't want to move. Yeah. So one play I might try to do is slice to the backhand and then immediately go to the forehand. If I give him, if I give him normal volleys, is it consistent? If I drop it short, does it freak him out? Again, just analyzing what I'm up against. All right, we like to see high volleys, I see that. I don't know if you guys can see this on camera, but my man is warming up very close to the net. So I know if he's coming in, lob's gonna be a nice option. Decent hands, not looking terribly confident on the backhand side, but confident all in all. Couple overheads, man. All right, this is gonna be important, because like I just said, my man likes to crowd the net. So let's see how well he moves back. I'm gonna give him an obnoxious yeah, nice feed point. and see if he can move back. I may have been mistaken. So I know uh, rule one of volleys is hit one. Hit one right at the guy. So eventually I gotta. His volleys seem pretty strong. I mean, I'm a strategy of mine is not gonna be try to bring him up to the net. Although if I can get it low at his shoe tips, then then maybe that is something I would Sorry. Do. This is gonna go right at him. Good Lord. He handles it pretty well. Like, this guy's a player. I'll just take a couple up. Yeah. Same with overheads. I mean, this guy's an experienced player and coming up to the net is not something that frightens him the way. Just one more and I'm good. A lot of guys at my level might be frightened. Ooh, maybe one more. I Shank think everyone misses, so I'm not even gonna count that as evidence of anything. Yeah, he's pretty good. Oh, Joel, you can't think like that. Sorry, man. <laughs> All right, so this guy, when he Ooh, wants bastards. to, can have a good serve. They're going to the middle. That might be where Come I and sort of shade. But I do think serving could be a vulnerability. I mean, he didn't seem blown away by my serves by any means, so I don't know that. Wait. He has some great kick. It does seem like he likes the center of the court. That's what I've known. I do not see anything going into the, into the doubles alley so far. Where it rolls in your hand? Yeah, yeah, Let's see how his serve is on me. He might not be so comfortable. He looks a little stiff on the ad side. I might actually... Oh, that was a great serve. I, you know what, on his serve, I think he can be as good or not good as he wants. I think it's a weapon. Is he looking comfortable catching that? If I'm hitting full pace here, what's his reaction? Looks a little freaked out. And then now as he's serving, of course I'm looking for the same thing. And as I warm up, I'm gonna literally split step with every single serve he hits so I get in a rhythm and understand what I'm fighting against. Kicker to start.
let's slice them out wide and just see what the reaction looks like. Kicker T, see his reaction. All right, let's get some service to that back end on the ad side and just see how vulnerable we think he's gonna feel returning these things. So every now and again, hit one back just to see that you've got the timing of their serve. You're working on your split step, but it's kind of hard to know until you make contact with one if you're really dialed in or not. So this is a tough one because obviously Scott is the you know the superior player on on paper, and so. I guess uh, as Joel's coach, my first message to him would be, you've got, you've got nothing to lose here. Like kind of classic mental, kind of release of like responsibility of needing to be the player who like comes away with a W. And knowing Joel and the fact that he's kind of um, avoided competition in the past, I feel like that's a really important message for Joel to hear and maybe to tell himself. But uh, tactically, I feel like there's one of two paths here. If Joel's gonna have a chance of, of winning this match, Knowing that Scott is like a, a counterpuncher style player and like very steady and he likes to receive pace, I feel like the first course of action for Joel should be to play steady back and maybe even take his foot off the gas a little bit and just kind of play weak and spinny shots and see if Scott can string together enough like winning type shots to really put Joel on the ropes and keep him there. And part of that being like a fitness test. like is Scott's endurance going to be good enough to be able to come away with aggressive swings and be consistent and maintain his fitness for more than two, three, four, you know, games in a row. If that path isn't working, then for me, plan B should be for Joel to swing all out, just kind of swing for the fences, nothing to lose kind of mentality. And the second part that I think Joel really needs to work on in his development as a player is just his overall confidence and his racket head speed. So this could be, if Joel has that mentality of nothing to lose, like I'm the underdog, this could be a fantastic opportunity for Joel to work on his, on his ability in match play to just go ahead, pick a target, and just swing out. Super free, super confident, and, and just try to take it to Scott. It's not my first, my first idea for Joel because Scott likes pace, and Scott likes playing with pace and sending it back. So that's my mindset. Three things, nothing to lose, Let's see if we can almost kind of rope-a-dope him a little bit, like play high spinny shots, make Scott hit a bunch of winners, number two. And then number three, if all else fails, just go for it and see if he can come out with a knockout punch. From hitting with Scott in the warm-up, it seems to me like there's no glaring weakness, there's no part of his game that stands out is horrible that I need to exploit. But I do think that if I am going to have a chance in this match against a former college player, then there's a few things I might do. One of them would be to move him around a lot. It doesn't seem like he is in the mood to be going side to side or front to back. So one play I might try is hit to one side and then immediately hit to the other side and just hope he'll get worn out and hope he'll miss. Uh, the other thing is that it does seem like when he gets a backhand deep, his return, the backhand he hits, falls short. So I might want to be ready to come in and try to hit the ball away. Now, whether I can execute that is, um, you know, to be seen. But those would be, you know, that would be the strategy. Move him a lot side to side and um, on his backhands, be ready to come up. All right, so as Joel and Scott get ready to face off, I will be coaching and helping Scott in this apartment. So my synopsis with Joel, um, I like to really identify what the sword, the weapon, the shield, steady Eddie, and the Achilles heel, the weaknesses. And, and with Joel, he obviously the sword is the forehand, and he's got a nice serve as well, but the, the forehand, everything he's hitting is about setting up that forehand, especially on the outer thirds of the court. He likes that big, high, heavy ball. Um, and as far as a shield, the backhand's steady, um, but you can tell he doesn't trust it a ton, especially as Scott really mixes up the trajectory, the depth, um, the, the, the shot tolerance on that particular wing is going to be the weakness. So the Achilles heel is gonna be the shot tolerance. Uh, Scott's jab at 60, 70% is gonna feel a lot like Joel's 90%. And that's when we start looking at shot tolerance. That is where Joel is, is gonna struggle here is, is really staying in these backhand rallies. Um, if that is the route that Scott goes in which he should, 
Um, you know, although Scott's forehand is bigger, there's no necessary reason to, to go head to head with the forehand, exploit the weakness, go after the backhand. All right, guys, so my quick synopsis of Joel here, and admittedly, like I get a little bit of information about him before the match, right? I learned that he's around a 4-0, maybe a low level 4-5 player. So I'm already expecting, to, you know, quite frankly, to just be better at most things in the warm up as a 5-0 level player. But it's still important to go through that warm up, see specific weaknesses, strengths. Definitely noticing a little bit weaker on the backhand side, particularly if I'm pushing him deep. I also notice that he seems very comfortable when I pull him out wide on the forehand side. He enjoys that short angle forehand. So even though I feel like I'm going to win most cross court rallies, that's not necessarily a pattern I should be excited to get into just because that's where he's going to be most comfortable. Um, I think a lot of us when we warm up are so focused on ourselves and what we've got going on. What I took away from that warm up, and again, it may sound a little bit arrogant, I feel like both of my cross court ground strokes are stronger than his. So I feel like if I can just get in a cross court ground stroke rally and take very little risk, I should come out ahead. So my strategy going into this match would just be stay very patient cross court. There's no reason really to take a lot of risks. You're not gonna see me go down the line unless I'm in really good position and there's a good risk reward scenario here. So my strategy honestly is just go out there and beat him in cross court ground stroke rallies, only take opportunities to redirect the ball when I'm in position and there's low risk, high reward, and just go out there and you know hopefully deliver the result you would expect to see from a 5-0 playing a 4-0-4-5. With like the best thing that could happen here is that Scott doesn't change anything and he just starts Joel just starts going for more and simplifies it and makes this mm -hmm. even a faster one-way traffic. Oh, it's a good slot. I like it. I like it. I mean, great point here. 